to IEP Radio, a show dedicated to the education of all things indoor environmental quality related. And now here's your host, Michael Schrantz. Welcome to IEP Radio. This is episode 30. Today, we'll be talking about the history of ERMIs, Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. We'll be talking about Hurts Me Too samples, something that Dr. Richie Shoemaker developed. And we'll be talking about the science behind all of it, MSQPCR, mold specific polymerase chain reaction. It's a mouthful. To help me get through this challenging topic, I have invited a friend and colleague, John Banta. John Banta is a certified industrial hygienist with a bachelor's degree in environmental health sciences and 35 years of experience investigating indoor environmental problems in homes. For the last 25 years, he has focused on mold and other water damage organisms and has specialized in medically important investigations for a decade. John has trained investigators and remediation companies, technicians, supervised crews and sewage, flood and fungal remediation throughout the United States. John has co-authored four editions of Prescriptions for a Healthy House, a practical guide for architects, builders and homeowners and several peer-reviewed publications. One of his current projects is his upcoming book, Mold Control. I gotta tell you something, one of my favorite interviews has to be this one. To be able to sit back with a friend and talk about these topics behind ERMI. We're not necessarily talking today about how to sample, but we're clearing the air up with everything that's been said, at least the hot topics about ERMI's good, ERMI's bad. What about that 2013 EPA document that they released saying it shouldn't be used for public use? Oh yeah, that's right. We go there in this podcast. We talk about the history and the evolution of where ERMI's even came from and the confusion that many people have with professionals when we are recommending that type of sampling, or should I say that type of analysis but people are getting hung up on what they've been hearing and reading online. John and I hope that today's conversation will shed some serious light on the value, the resolution, the sensitivity that MSQPCR sampling has, and to also show where there are other considerations. DIY sampling is discussed a little bit, and some of the challenges with that, working with the professional still matters. So we hope you enjoy this podcast. Let's dive in. Good morning, John. Welcome to the show. Good morning. How are you doing today? Doing good. I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited about today's podcast, episode 30 today. As you know, we're going to be diving into MSQPCR, ERMI, Hurts Me Too. Oh my gosh, for you listeners, what are these terms? What do they all mean? We're going to explore those today. We're going to get into some open mic coffee shop talk and really show you our, our our knowledge and our experience, what we feel about these different types of technologies, where they have great uses. We also want to clear the air up. There is so much information out there. People that quote unquote love Ermes, people that hate Ermes, um, and, and a wide range in between. So I'm welcoming John to the show this morning because he comes with a, a wealth of information and experience in this particular topic. And I thought what, what further way, or better way to start today's conversation by just educating the audience a little bit on the topic of Ermes and what they were before they became an Ermi. So John, would you enlighten the audience and maybe we can dive in a little bit about the topic of PCR? Sure. So um, PCR is a technology that has found its way into many, many different um, occupations and, and, and fields. Um, and I, I think prior to two and a half years ago, it was a term that very few people had heard. But I would say that most of this listening audience is going to be familiar with PCR now from the standpoint that that's the primary technique that's being used to diagnose COVID-19. Uh, one of the major differences between using PCR for mold and for COVID-19 is with COVID-19, they're looking at the RNA for the virus, whereas uh, the laboratories that, that we work with were um, identifying different types of molds using this DNA-based technique uh, are looking at the DNA or snippets of DNA 
uh, for the individual organisms of, of interest. Obviously, there was an attraction. All this stuff was going on in the beginning, but it was really in the laboratories. We weren't commercially making, certainly the COVID is a, a different conversation. That's much later. That's much more recent. But in the beginning, this was just more of a laboratory thing. We weren't out doing, um, as, a, as a regular habit, PCR analysis in the field. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, you know, I mean, at, at first, when um, PCR for mold was developed, uh, it was uh, difficult to find a laboratory that would actually run those samples for you. Um, much easier to find PCR laboratories that were uh, using it for medicine, for um, police work, forensics. Uh, Fish and Game, the Department of Fish and Game has actually found some really interesting uses for PCR. Um, uh, that uh, uh, basically the technology is such that they can go to one of the Great Lakes if they're concerned that there's an invasive fish species that's gotten in there that's killing off the, the native fish population. They can walk up to the edge of this body of water, collect a, a sample of water, uh, and uh, run it through PCR analysis for that uh, for that um, uh, carp or you know whatever it is that they're trying to find. And if that carp is in that lake, uh, they're going to get uh, information that, that tells them that it's there. Incredibly uh, sensitive. Incredibly uh, sensitive, which which can be one of its downfalls if all you're using is PCR. Uh, enter the the technique of MSQ PCR, which is mold specific, and the key word here is quantitative. So that means that they can actually come up with some numbers uh, for the polymerase chain reaction. Uh, so, we, so we have, not to interrupt you, John, we have PCR in the beginning, which is a very sensitive uh, uh, technology, but it's not quantifying us. It's not necessarily giving us numbers to it's use. It's a yes it's or no. It's a yes right. or no answer. Right. Almost like an absence presence type test. Correct. Then they're like, well, we could do more with this and let's get it. Let's go into qPCR, which again, without turning this into a history lesson, quantifies us, gives us numbers. Now more people are starting to get familiar but MS, that's what you were getting at, is mold-specific. Mold-specific quantitative PCR. And so EPA took on the challenge uh, of um, identifying a technique using PCR that could be used for, um, for certain organisms. Uh, they actually ended up patenting the techniques for identifying about 100 different types of molds. And um, of those, uh, a determination was made that a specific 36 were going to be the most applicable with regards to um, what uh, what we do with, with indoor environments. You know, the thing is molds are everywhere. There are lots of uses for molds. And so there were a lot of other types of molds that they developed techniques for analyzing for uh, to help satisfy uh, the food industry, um, agriculture, uh, a lot of various types of organisms that that we may never hear about uh, that caused tremendous amounts of damage to plants and, and other uh, types of species out there. Uh, and uh, so from an economic standpoint, you know, if the almond grower can identify the problems in his orchard early on, which again, because the DNA methods are so incredibly sensitive, uh, it may buy them several weeks uh, of, of time where they can use a, uh, a less toxic or less invasive method in order to treat their fields uh, or their orchards prior to having to pull out the, uh, the heavy hitters and the, uh, the high levels of pesticides. So lots of, lots of interesting things that uh, developed from this. So what we have on the screen right now, just to help the audience with the transitioning a little bit is we've gotten a general history of PCR, qPCR, enter into the world mold specific or MSQ PCR. The EPA is very much involved into it. One of the top leaders in the field is Dr. Stephen Vesper, who you can see at the top of, the, of this paper here, his name, and they start doing this study. So now we're starting to get close to this word uh, called ERMI, uh, Environmental Relative Moldiness Index. Um, John, take the uh, audience, if you don't mind, through kind of a summary of what they were doing in this study and what they were trying to show everybody when they published this in August of 2007. Sure. So they they had the patent. Uh, the patent for um, MSQ-PCR has been out for, uh, I 
believe it's 22 years now. Uh, in fact, the patent has expired. Uh, they can't renew it anymore. Um, and so it's become a uh, public domain at this point. What they did um, in order to uh, attempt to, to um, figure out just where this methodology would fit into things, they went out and they tested over a thousand homes. I think it was um, about 1,097 that they actually ended up uh, using for the studies. Um, the paper said that dust was collected from uh, 1,144, but um, there are sometimes things that happen with regards to uh, samples that cause them not to be um, usable. In fact, if you highlight in the paragraph just below, the analysis of the 1,096 dust samples were completed by EPA. Um, so it was 1,096. I was off by one. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> All right. A lot of numbers you have to remember, John. They took this sample set of yes. 1,096, ultimately 1,096 homes, and they analyzed the data. They analyzed the data, and they came up with this chart that's published in this study uh, that summarizes what uh, values they came up with. And so uh, the first column there shows the organisms that were a part of the um, mold specific. Uh, analysis that they did. It was divided into two groups. There was a group one and a group two. Uh, the group two organisms are the ones that represent those organisms that were considered most likely to be coming from the outdoors. Um, and um, what we know um, historically is that if you have something floating around outside, you're going to find it inside. And in a healthy building, you'll typically find it at lower levels than what um, uh, are present in, in the outdoor. So space. just to help the audience out, not to interrupt, don't lose your flow, John. If you come back with an ERMI sample and you have no group two molds, 9.999 times out of 10, John and I would be suspicious that you didn't either collect a sample or there were some serious problems with the sample. We are expecting to find mold in your house, even if you don't have a mold source in it or under it or on top of it. That is absolutely right. And uh, those group two organisms are extremely important. Um, so uh, if I don't see them, um, I start asking questions. Um, and there are some ways that laboratories can apply quality control principles in order to um, help to determine whether the samples are gonna be valid or not. Um, unfortunately, not all the laboratories out there do it or uh, publish it on the, on the reports which makes my job uh, as a consultant quite a bit harder from the standpoint of interpreting those results. John, help us out real quick. I know that I wanna talk to you in a little bit more about our own experiences, how we use it. I wanna be able to get through the, the conversation of like the evolution of, of ERMI and what it is for the audience so they can keep track on the timeline. But one thing you mentioned was what you and I know is the 37th organism. Would you just mind tell, telling people real quick of a way that some of these labs try to look for a thing called inhibition in the sample. So what they do is they take an organism called geotricum candidum, and they add a known quantity of geotricum candidum to the sample. And then they run that sample uh, just like they would if they were looking for all these other organisms. Um, but um, basically what they want to find is approximately the same amount of geotricum uh, in the results that they get at the end of running that sample uh, as what they added in. And if they don't see the geotricum there, uh, then um, you know that's uh, there's something wrong. Uh, geotricum is not commonly found in indoor environments. And so we, uh, we don't have that problem with interference from the indoors uh, and from the dust that's supplied. Um, and if the geotricum isn't there at the end, the question becomes why? And there are a number of substances that can be found in homes that can affect the TAC polymerase uh, part of the um, chain reaction that, that occurs in order to allow the analysis to occur successfully. And so this is a quality control measure that's used to help double check and make sure that things are really coming out the way that they should. Right. So we'll have to have another episode on and you've, you've presented on the topic as much about the deeper levels of what an inhibition can look like, known inhibitors, even some of the imperfections of the, the variances in labs where 
Some of it we know, some of it unfortunately we don't know. What are these tolerances of inhibition? We're not looking for the perfect sample, but how much allowance of inhibited, inhibited inhibition can we really have before the sample starts to be unreliable? I think the takeaway from what you're saying, John, is that in summary, labs do make efforts to get help ensure that the data that you're seeing on your report is accurate. Um, now, the study and, that- And that's have, what we insist on from the labs that we work with. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, like I said, a whole other podcast. It's like, I know we want to, we do a lot to the integrity of the data matters. Um, because like you said, uh, being so sensitive is a great thing. The ability to detect high resolution, you know, small uh, fungal uh, structures with DNA in it, um, which is way more forensic, way more able to, to uh, identify what you might say as a, as a representation of total biomass. But obviously that sensitivity needs to be in check and there's things that can affect that. So, so let me ask you this. So they put together this study. They obviously have different columns. The first column, as you said, are the species that they ended up zeroing down on. Um, and then, of course, we have these other columns. Would you mind just touching on those real quick? Sure. The, the percent occurrence was what percentage of the samples, the 1,096 samples that they analyzed, had that particular organism in them? And um, if, um, if you look at these, I don't think we had any that were zero. No. There were none that were zero. There were some right. that were pretty low, but... Right. Um, but for the most part, you know, the, the levels were, um, were pretty significant, right. um, which, which means that we've got to realize that every, uh, every sample has a, a strong potential for having, you know, problematic types of organisms in it, but that doesn't make them problems when they're at low enough levels. Uh, in right. fact, Stachybotrys is one of the more infamous organisms out there, and um, Stachybotrys had 35% of the samples were positive for Stachybotrys. Right. And, and at first glance, you know, that, that might make people look at it and say, oh my goodness, that means 35% of the buildings have Stachybotrys growth in them. And that's not necessarily true. Um, what they may have is small quantities of the organism that have come in from the outside. There was a study done in Texas. Um, oh, it was back in the early 2000s. Um, where they were doing outdoor air sampling. And um, what they estimated for the Houston area was that 4% of the outdoor samples were going to have um, stachybotrys in them. Very small amounts, but stachybotrys nonetheless. Anyway, our, our second column um, provides, or our third column actually, provides the average uh, that they uh, were able to calculate from those 1,097 uh, organisms. And so basically they added up each of those organisms, all 1,096 of the uh, of the uh, studies, and um, and then divided by 1,096 to get the average or the mean, um, and then they calculated the standard deviation from the average, and so that's a statistical factor that that gives us an idea of how closely the um, the numbers were to one another. Were they fairly concise, or did we have some uh, huge amounts of, of uh, uh, variation. And, and so, you see that. You see that in a few of these, the huge mm -hmm. variations. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, Aspergillus penicillides is, is one of those with a huge variation. Um, so the average was 8,600 for Aspergillus penicillides, um, but the, um, uh, the standard deviation was 18. There's a comma misplaced there. It's the misplaced. Right. 181,000. 181,759. So that that basically could be a very wide range of uh, organisms. And then for that particular one, highest concentration was uh, 6 million. That was the most that they saw in any one sample. Uh, but my favorite column, and I think one of the most important things that, that the EPA published was what's known as the geometric mean. And um, the geometric mean basically gives us an idea of what um, what the normal levels would actually be. It tends to um, discount outliers. So if I took the numbers one, two, three, four, and a million, and I took the average of that, that would be around 
200,002, which really doesn't represent one, two, three, four very well, but it doesn't represent a million very well either. But the geometric mean for one, two, three, four, and a million is 27. And 27 right. is much, much closer to one, two, three, four uh, than it is to a million. Uh, and so that gives us an idea of what, what normal would be. The more data points that you have, uh, the closer you're going to get to what is actually um, a uh, centralized normal level for, for organism. It might so, be good to tell the audience too, just again, another quick nugget I saw as you were talking is, for those who have heard the story or the narrative that you can't have any stacking in the home for there to be an issue. And, and John and I have been doing some other studies on outdoor sampling, all that. Maybe we can talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about another podcast, but is that is that again, it's normal to have some levels. You, you, you can't assume that if you have two in the home of stacky, that you must have in quotes, a mold problem. It doesn't mean you don't. John might look at this as an investigator and go, huh, two, huh? That's interesting because it's different in the other rooms. And there's also some visual and historic things I got to take into consideration, but we're not making one assumption in either direction based off of just this data alone. I just want to speak to the people that think that they have to have zero. What you will find as this discussion evolves today in this podcast is that this whole concept of what's normal in your home might include different species that you once thought were only going to grow in a water damage situation. Yeah, and, and I think that that brings up an important point. Um, you've got uh, growth, uh, but then you've also got spores that travel around from place to place. And, um, and there's a big difference between the way that we deal with growth versus settled spores that have come into environments. And then the other thing that I think is real important is um, there's something known as the hygiene principle. And the concept with that is that if, if you put a person or an animal uh, into a very, uh, very, very ultra clean, too clean, sterile type of environment and don't expose them to organisms, um, that's not going to help them develop their immune system. That's not going to help them uh, uh, have their bodies recognized uh, when there is a, a danger point. Um, and um, so um, a, um, a certain amount of each of these things that we're exposed to uh, it's, it's likely to help. I make. I want to also make another observation as we get through this study is not once have we talked about, other than in the beginning when I introduced this paper, the term ERMI. Right now, all we're showing you is the raw data behind the scenes of everything that was looked at, which ironically, uh, John and I and many others still use wholeheartedly to help us. This is, this is a gold mine of information um, I will tell you that the, the study here, as you, you continue reading it, starts to introduce um, how the ERMI was um, put together into these different quadrants. They use the graph for visual representation. And this might be our first major, uh, let me rephrase that, a sticking point that a lot of people have. John, let's just take a minute as we wrap up this particular document. The purpose of it was to show how they created the ERMI and what it was all about. And we're not talking about whether John and I agree with it yet or not. What we're talking about is what it is. So John, would you take a minute and, and kind of summarize? So they have all this raw data and then they come up with an, an algorithm using logarithmic formulas and all these things to ultimately produce a index that was supposed to help identify the likelihood of having, I guess the term would be a mold burden in the home. Yes. Uh, elaborate on that. So, so basically what they did was they developed a statistic and that um, is known as the ERMI score. And uh, it's really unfortunate in my opinion that, that they didn't separate out the MSQ PCR part of this with the organisms, which was the first thing that we were talking about before this from the ERMI score. Yeah, that, that part there from this part here. Um, the, the thing about ERMI scores is that uh, they can be very useful in research when you have huge numbers of data points. Um, if, if you're looking at a thousand buildings or even a hundred buildings, then um, the, the variations and, um, and the unusual spikes that will occur 
uh, when you're dealing with anything uh, biological uh, will um, kind of be absorbed into that data so that they're just not problems. And so you can look at the big picture as far as research is concerned. And so um, uh, there was a, there was a um, paper that was released by EPA. Are you ready to go into this yet, Michael? That's fine. <laughs> I, might, I might take us back, but let me say this before you bring the paper up. This research that Dr. Vesper and others was doing is still highly valuable. It might not fit the model of somebody with Lyme or CIRS or PANS or PANDAS or SIBO or Alzheimer's, but it will always hold a value because as you will see when this, this story develops is that there's kind of a narration, speaking of published paper statements, but uh, to, to, to tie this nice and pretty, this ERMI score came out. It was a great initial tool. What I think a lot of inspectors found was there 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 was some chaos in 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 the pursuit of using it. There were people doing their own kits, making um, big conclusions. I have to sell my home. I have to throw away all my books, and that, those horrible stories we hear all the time, based off of an ERMI score. And I don't think it was ever the intention of EPA to to ever use it to that level of um, use. Not to mention the anomalies as professionals which I can't wait to get into here in a little bit, that we started noticing. So yeah. now we bring in the paper you talked about. So uh, to, to what you were just speaking about, though, yeah. one of the things about the ERMI score, it takes these 36 different organisms and the numbers associated with all of them, and it combines them all into one number. And there's just no way you can do that. And right. It takes what, all, to, to help the people out, it takes all of this amazing data and tries to make it simple, which is the goal. I just want to be able to press one button. I want to be able to see one number. Who doesn't it think that's a the numbers. But, but right. another really important thing about ERMI, ERMI is an indicator of dampness, humidity, or water damage. It is not a health index. Right. There's nothing about ERMI, uh, that, uh, the ERMI score number that, that is associated with health directly. Uh, in fact, a number of the organisms on the ERMI uh, in the water damage area, uh, group group one organism section um, are not known to cause any adverse health effects. It's tricky, right? And and so tricky. fine. So you, you tease the audience, as did I. Let's talk about an elephant in the room, the paper okay. that a lot of people bring up. Okay. So um, back in um, uh, 2013, um, a complaint was lodged with the Office of the Inspector General um, by an attorney. Um, who was basically questioning the use of um, ERMI as it was being used for interpreting um, single residences. And um, it resulted in an investigation on the part of the Office of the Inspector General. Um, interestingly enough, they never told EPA to stop um, offering ERMI through the, uh, through the licensees that they had uh, developed. It is interesting. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, that that continued on, but basically what they said was that um, MSQ, PCR, and ERMI were research tools not intended for public use. And um, you know, to a certain extent, I I agree with that from the standpoint that this is a, a terribly complex and complicated subject, and. If somebody's just getting a single number and making these unwise choices because they don't understand uh, what's going on with it, that that can be a problem. But as a professional, um, it's another tool in my tool belt, and I really appreciate having DNA available for doing the types of studies and research that we do. Um, it's um, it's not perfect but none of the methodologies that we have available to us are perfect. And it is the only methodology available that we'll find um, both viable and non-viable organisms. So alive, dead, or dormant, it will find for those 36 organisms, the DNA that's present for those. Um, with um, the other um, species technique that we have available for us, uh, it's culturable. And culturable will only find the viable organisms. It'll only find what's alive or dormant. It will not find what's dead. And so um, 
you know, we, we know from other research that spores do die off. Uh, fragments don't, uh, don't necessarily maintain their viability. Uh, and in fact, in one uh, study, it was estimated that uh, anywhere from 300 to 500 times more material uh, is going to be non-viable uh, than, than viable. And so, does it, and doesn't mean for all you IEPs listening out there, because I can I, I can already sense the energy from a couple of you out there that we're saying we don't like other methods. This is not the purpose of this particular interview. Um, I, uh, petri dishes, culturing have their purpose. I know for a fact John actually does them more than I do them. Uh, so, so there, we're not we're not poo pooing anything right now. We're just saying we're trying to show the clarity that MSQ PCR, which I think unfairly got wrapped into the public's uh, opinion of like it's the same as an ermy and there's a lot of confusion um i think really hurt the industry because you have something that's very surgically advanced i mean res from a resolution standpoint in the right hands not the public's and i thought i want to get your feedback on this john i thought that was interesting the terms that they did use be used for research that's funny i thought i am researching your home is that just a is that just you know, tomatoes, tomatoes. I mean, I, 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 it's also saying the term public use. Well, I would agree. If you asked me what I think about your car, if something wasn't working right, I wouldn't trust my answer. Uh, I'm not qualified to, to be an auto mechanic for your vehicle. However, if you're doing it as a professional who's done thousands of these samples and you are seeing patterns and you are doing, you are reading the studies that ironically are still coming out of the EPA's office, about MSQ PCR analysis and all the validity behind it, it can be a great tool. How would you respond to those comments? I agree with you a, a thousand percent. Um, yeah, I'm um, uh, as as you said. I do put a lot of confidence and faith into culturable with speciation. I mean, I've been doing this for thirty five years, and ERMI was developed twenty two years ago. Well, MSQ PCR uh, was developed twenty two years ago. Uh, which led to um, to ERMI being um, made available. But um, uh, prior to this happening, I, I was in this field for a good 15 years before and had to rely entirely on culturable. And, and it was with my eyes wide open. I realized that if you had a home that was built um, in, in uh, the early 1900s, um, chances of water damage that resulted in mold still being in that building, but not detectable by any of the methods that we had available uh, was really high, really good chance of that. Right. Um, and um, that's what we had available and that's what we had to work with. And I think that a lot of these uh, statements that we've heard over the years about how, um, you know, you don't, you don't need to sample, you can just go based on how the occupants are feeling, uh, and on the visual inspections and on visible mold and musty odors and things of that nature um, is, is all true. Uh, but at the same time, um, when we're able to be looking at numbers and, and having an objective look at these sorts of things, it just gives us so much more data and helps us to really zero in on, on where the issues are. Um, my, my wife, um, basically had a health crisis in her mid thirties. And, um, and one of the things that that involved was becoming hypersensitive to mold. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that was 35 years ago, approximately. And, um, at that time, basically the doctors didn't really understand anything about this stuff. Um, the environmental consultants out there may have had a clue, but they really didn't didn't get it and certainly did not have the tools available to, to deal with it. And so, um, you know, very common for people back then and, and even today um, uh, to be advised that maybe they needed to go speak with a psychiatrist um, because uh, it was in their head. And, um, you know, we, we know today that uh, um, somebody may be crazy, but that doesn't mean that mold isn't affecting them. No, <laughs> no, no, boy, you know, I tell you, John and I have some of the best conversations because we keep bringing up topics that could come up, you know, could last hours long, including the topic of, oh, it's just in your head. And, 
for me, the takeaway for MSQPCR and for the ERMI, and, I want, and I'll pull, I'll jump off of this document in doing so, is that I agree with the general concern that ERMI shouldn't be used by the public to make random decisions. I think we're learning more as we go, but not to make any critical decisions. I do think that MSQPCR uh, is, is a fabulous tool in the professional's hands. But unfortunately, this document that we're staring at right now did bring up a lot of things. And so many of you that are listening right now probably have had an inspector that comes out and maybe you bring up the term ERMI without any of this context and history. And, and all you hear is, uh, well, it's an ERMI and the EPA came out with a, a statement that would be this one right here. It's like, yeah, but you're you're missing the, the points that John and I are talking about. It does, an ERMI doesn't represent um, MSQPCR and all its capabilities. It would be like the equivalent for the IEPs who are aware of saying that my uh, microscopy is not a good tool to use because we may or may not like spore traps, which are analyzed under a microscope ultimately. So it you know you don't get rid of the microscope just because you don't maybe like an inter a part of an interpretation and I think that was what the issue was is the EPA had an, a, an interpretation tool this index that has value but maybe not in the way that John and I are working with people with chronic illness and looking for something that is higher resolution more sensitive better able to detect the fragments the the structures that are way more readily present I've said this a thousand times and so do the studies that. For every one mold spore you have, the evidence would suggest that anywhere between 300 and 1,000 fragments of that same mold exist per spore. And some studies, one in particular, would suggest that they estimate it's much higher than that. The point is, there's way more fragments. And this type of technology, assuming it's one of those 36 molds and there's DNA in that fragment, which there typically is in that case, can hopefully be identified. Now, to, now, John, I, I'm watching our time and I want to be able to cover some other great nuggets about this whole ERMI, MSQ, PCR. I want to bring into Hertz me into the play if we have time. But the EPA did come out with a second study. You just want to touch up on what they did as this follow up. They published this in 2020. So we're jumping forward from a study originally in 2007, uh, a confusing EPA pay paper and how to interpret in 2013. And now we have this study here from 2020. What is this telling us in summary? So what they did was they looked at another 703 buildings, analyzed them using the same technologies that were used uh, originally um, and uh, that we've been talking about today, and uh, then published the uh, the information, the data, um, and um, uh, basically published it in a chart that was very similar to um, uh, what we um, saw earlier from the study back in 2013. Um, and they compared the um, American Healthy Homes Survey is what it was called, one from uh, 2013 to the American Healthy Homes Survey, which was just done a few years ago and came up with uh, comparisons. Um, that allow us to um, consider what has happened over time. They also did something else that I thought was really interesting. Um, this time they, they looked at the age of the buildings. How old was the building that they were considering? And um, what they were able to do statistically from that was that older buildings tend to have more mold problems than there's a There's a shocker. There's a shocker. You know, I mean, right. that makes sense. Um, if, you, if you look at what the insurance um, actuaries are saying, uh, they're saying that a typical home uh, today has a chance of about, um, uh, well, of having a major water damage once every 25 years. And so if you've got a home that's 75 years old, uh, chances of there having been major water damages would be three of them in a 75 year period. So if you've got a building that, um, that's brand new, um, it's probably not had a water damage, right? Well, no, there was another study that was published um, quite a few years ago that looked at about 250 brand new buildings. And um, what they found was that one out of every five of them had water damage issues before it was ever occupied for the first time. For the majority of the population, that may not be a problem. But if you're in the 24% uh, that, um, that has been shown to be genetically hypersensitive or have the potential to be genetically hypersensitive to mold, uh, that home could be a real problem for you. Um, right. 
So um, only one to four percent of the population is actively um, uh, hypersensitive to mold at any given point, but um, but that's from that twenty four percent that have that genetic potential. Right, and whether or not it's twenty four percent, it's thirty percent. Whether someone wants to argue, I heard this. The purpose of this test and what we're really talking about beyond its history is that it can be a great tool to use in the right hands to help understand whether or not the home reflects normal fungal ecology. I mean, even if you weren't, a, 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 you've heard different terms, of course, but a 24% or a 25% or whatever number you'd like to use, it doesn't mean that John and I recommend that you should go eat a big bowl of stacky botrys for breakfast in the morning. We still want your house to be reflective of a normal fungal ecology and we have a tool that's really forensic so to to stitch this together even better so we have this original study that they did in 2007 they compared that against this study that was more recent that i think technically was done in 2019 published in 2020 showing the comparisons john is absolutely right one of the things they took into consideration is the age of the building which is kind of a cool thing maybe all of us could say yeah we could guess that but it's nice to see the research showing that not just assuming it because of a little thing called common sense um also to john's point it doesn't mean that a new home doesn't have a problem and he used that example to illustrate that john reached out to me not too horribly long ago um and sent me an email and asked me if i had seen a document and the document is the one I'm about to pull up right now. And it's this, and it was a, a newer document that came out. Um, gosh, when was it? Was it? Um, it's been recent. I mean, I think it was, I think it was 2022. Very recent the document. Beginning. Yeah. And there's a couple of nuggets here. There's a couple of subtle things I want the audience to see. This is, think about the 2013 document that everyone refers to. I want John to take a moment, if you're willing. I know we talked about this already. I guess it was published September of 2021, according okay. to the document. So, but but anyway, relatively recent. Um, uh, talk to them about what we noticed or what you noticed that this paper was saying. Well, what they did was they they focused more in on the ERMI relative index, so not the MSQPCR. Um, it, with the original paper, basically they they said that it was all for only research purposes. Right. Look, and if you if you look again, just I know I know you all believe us, but if you look at the wording, you'll see they're adding MSQPCR multiple times, and that that like I said, I think that was kind of an unfair. I think it got confusing to the audience, but the paper here, other so it mentions yeah. it once, I think. <laughs> yeah. So they. The, the, the title of that section, why develop a moldiness index? Right, right, right. Why develop a moldiness index? So they're not talking about the MSQPCR technology. They're talking about that moldiness index. And by right. the time that this study was, this paper was released, um, we were deep into COVID. You know, I mean, the use of PCR was was becoming more and more recognized by the general public from that standpoint. But one of the things that they did was they cited an Institute of Medicine report from 2004 um, that dealt with dampness in indoor spaces. And in that paper, there was a recommendation that was made uh, that um, um, there needed to be application of the new method or improved methods to allow more valid exposure assessments of microorganisms and their components, which should facilitate more informed risk assessments. And it says, and this is key. As a result, EPA researchers developed a DNA-based method for quantifying molds called uh, mold-specific quantitative PCR. The application of the MSQ PCR technology resulted in the development of ERMI. And so they they really laid out the timeline here. Um, it's it doesn't come right out and say, yeah, this has been validated or we you know we agree with its use. Uh, but EPA hasn't done that for any of the techniques with regards to mold analysis. Um, right. And so, um, but but it's it's kind of throwing this into the mix and and letting those of us that are, you know, doing this type of work and are in the know of it, uh, recognize that, yeah, you know, this is after, you know, 30 plus years after PCR was was first invented. Uh, and um, it's it's coming into its own. And more and more applications where it is um, finding 
um, excellent use. Um, and you mentioned something offline to me, by the way, speaking about its use, and I thought it would be key for the audience to hear this, which we were talking about validation and, and uses of MSQPCR, and I think you made a reference to a World War II uh, use of, of the Anderson sampler. Uh, could you kind of just kind of give that comparison and maybe some ironies or what about like a, a, a known sample as a Petri dish air sample or you can get into what that is real quick. And then, and then the irony of how much research has been done is on MSQPCR. Yeah. So um, in, in World War II, one of the concerns was that Nazi Germany was going to be using biological weapons on, um, on troops. And um, the Anderson air sampler was a device that was developed back in that time uh, in order to be able to collect air samples and determine whether or not these types of conditions existed. Now, Anderson air sampling is a culture-based method, which means you have to let it grow. You know, it takes time. Uh, and so back in the, uh, uh, in the 1940s, it's, it's not like, you know, you could end up with, with somebody uh, being exposed to um, anthrax or, or uh, some other biological weapon and instantly or in four hours be able to make a determination as to what it was that they had been exposed to. You had to, you know, collect it, collect the air sample, uh, get it into a laboratory where they could um, start to grow it and then wait for it to grow and then possibly go through the process of making multiple um, dilutions and culturing it on different types of media in order to do the identification that was necessary. So it wasn't a rapid analysis, but it was something that was developed back then. And this was actually one of the very first samplers that I uh, used for air sampling uh, 35 years ago. It was um, well researched, it was well developed, um, and it, it took, you know, from uh, uh, 1940s until uh, the um, uh, late 1970s um, for me to, to um, you know, learn about this stuff and get to a point where I felt comfortable with it. But it had been used for a period of time and there was research studies that had been, um, that had been posted. Um, it became the standard for the industry. Um, and now we've got uh, DNA methodologies that have been around for over 20 years. Um, and it's, it's time for those to also, uh, because of the literally thousands of studies, if, if you, um, if you look at MSQPCR uh, and do a literature search for it, uh, there have been thousands of studies that have been completed with regards to um, asthma and allergies and the total mold burden that, um, uh, that uh, there we go. Um, Just an example that this is not some bar napkin rough draft technology that's used by two people in the country and the, and it's you know there's there's different ways to look up and i'm just on google scholar just typed in msqpcr and i got over 500 hits um so um this methodology was used in the international space station um uh, I, I don't know how many people know that uh that, that has been a huge problem in space you know you've got um the the problems with moisture and humidity and um uh, you know, we shed skin cells and, and various other types of, of uh, organic materials into the, into the space station. And um, uh, if, if you build it, they will come, uh, no matter how they try to be careful about maintaining sterile environments and not taking pathogens onto the uh, space station. They're there and they're, they're growing like crazy. Um, in fact, um, one of our colleagues, um, or two of our colleagues, Bob and Gail Brandes, uh, they helped produce a video called Mutant Mold in Space, which um, it's, it's about, you know, how we've actually been um, sending. Do you have that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I thought I had it at the house, but it's here. Okay. <laughs> and um, anyway, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible all the various ways that it has been used and published and the uh, value that we, that we find in it. But, but I think what Michael said earlier is real important. That doesn't mean that we, we throw out the baby. You know, I mean, 
um, every single mold investigation, it should start with, uh, you know, uh, some foundational types of things. You need to do the visual inspection. If you've got visible mold, you probably don't need any testing to tell you that, yeah, there's a problem. Now the testing can further to define what the problem is, you know, what kinds of mold it is, what kinds of moisture ranges are those particular species of mold able to grow in and, and things of that nature. But if you've got mustiness, um, if you've got um, visible mold, if you've got a history of water damage and it was not resolved in, in the appropriate way, you know, let's say somebody came in and sprayed it with chlorine bleach and painted over it, um, that's not going to take care of what's likely to be inside those wall cavities. And so all of those factors can help with the determination that, yes, there is a mold problem. But then right. when you want to start quantifying it, uh, there are these other techniques that can be used to help figure out uh, how, how bad it is. One of the things, um, when EPA did these studies, um, they were, they were uh, collecting dust from approximately 500 square feet within uh, these buildings that they were researching. And um, uh, if you start collecting, if you have a 3,000 square foot building and you collect one sample from that entire building, all over that entire building, and have it analyzed by this technique and then compare it to the statistics uh, that EPA developed for the 500 square foot approximately buildings, um, or 500 square foot areas within buildings, um, what happens is you can end up with a lot of dilution that makes things look a whole lot better than they actually are likely to be. And so the way that uh, buildings get looked at, it's, it's real important that you know what you're uh, doing and, and where the sample should be collected and how much dust is needed and everything else in order to get it to a point where, um, where we can uh, actually do firm comparisons with, with other types of data. So let me, let me summarize for the audience where we're at. And as we get into the home stretch and talk about some juicy nuggets and takeaways, maybe we can bring into uh, this, the ge a geographic distribution study to illustrate the key about that different climates, environments matter. Um, the, if we need to talk about the comparison study of electrostatic cloths to the floor samples, that's fine. And that hurts me too. But just to bring everybody up to speed right now, We've talked about the history of PCR, obviously from a, a 50,000 foot perspective, there's way more there, but to let the audience know this was a long time coming. Then we had it, QPCR to quantify this uh, uh, data, and then we got into mold specific, and then we, we realized that the EPA was an integral part of it, helped develop with that technology, this thing called an ERMI, which created this index, which we learned along the way was a a great tool for a lot of other purposes, but we found that one simple data point was not really a, a great way for colleagues and professionals to um, understand the home of whether or not the, there's a source in the home or if it's coming from the outdoors or if it's because of the way that these occupants live in their home. They're very active. That's that they live near a farm. The, you, the, all of this stuff matters. And uh, as John alluded to a moment ago, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There's a lot of great information that you can get with MSQ PCR. Even I've fallen guilty of telling people you'll do an ERMI sample, but it's funny because I seldom use the ERMI score. Uh, I do agree if you have an ERMI that's a 50 or a 40 in the high 30s, it oftentimes correlates with some um, associated issue going on in the home. But a lot of people get those ERMI ranges, the scores where you need more interpretation. And that's that's kind of where I want to get into on our last little piece here, which is, I think one of the, the frustrations is that our industry, and I don't know that I, sh I should include John and I in that, but our <laughs> industry as a whole has created this idea that you can just go to the store, go online, purchase a DIY mold kit, whether it's a Petri dish, whether it's a uh, an, an ERMI sample, and just be able to tell what's going on in your home. And I, I find it ironic because I, I really feel like that's that that is available. That's true. And I feel like it's kind of given the the, the public these the feeling that it's as easy as one, two, three. You should just be able to inter like check in the car oil, which is difficult for some people uh, in their car. It's either a good or it's not. The home, the mold, we live on Earth, not a bubble on Mars. There is mold that surround us, whether it's a group one mold, 
whether it's a group two mold, whether it's molds that are not even being identified or addressed on the ERMI panel, we are expecting you're gonna have some background levels. That is not an easy as one, two, three thing to figure out. It requires professional help and guidance. You wouldn't go to your local grocery store to get a health on or to get help or assistance on treatment for your Lyme, you wouldn't, you would see a professional. Um, and John and I have experienced usually the end results of a lot of people who show up frustrated, deflated, exhausted financially, uh, because they've spent all this money. And we're like, you know, unfortunately, John and I, who are very sympathetic and empathetic in other ways, see that and go, man, if only you'd have done this and only you would have done that. And the problem is, is those only should have done this, only should have done that depend on the person and the situation. It's not standard or the same for everybody. Hence the need to have professional help. As we segue into that topic of the use of MSQPCR, um, John and I've really, we've known each other for a number of years. Um, but really found common ground and a way to bond professionally through MSQPCR. And I'll tell you, we've learned a lot of interesting things along the way. I want to give John the microphone to share some nuggets that he think might be valuable to you as you understand where, where an ERMI sample, and I want us to start thinking of it as an MSQPCR sample, a dust sample, may have its value and things to consider. We'll start with a basic one since we already have the paper up. Let's talk about geographic considerations. John, if I sample a house in Tucson, Arizona, and I sample another ha a home in Miami, Florida, should I expect to have the same molds and concentrations in it if I somehow knew there were no mold issues in the house? Well, everybody knows there's no uh, mold in Arizona. Home oh, there's another, th thanks, John, thanks a lot. <laughs> Actually, some of the moldiest homes I've ever seen have been in places right. like Las Vegas, Nevada, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Dry states. Phoenix, Arizona. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, uh, in Arizona, we have monsoon season. And so water can get into places. I, I think one of the problems with, with buildings in these areas is that um, uh, people think, oh, well, we don't have much water. It's a dry desert type of environment. And therefore we're not gonna have a mold problem. And people get sloppy. They don't maintain their buildings as well. They don't um, uh, build as well uh, in these areas as you would have to if you were in a, a wetter part of the country. But different molds have different um, types of niches that they like to occupy. And if you scroll down to some of the US maps, um, you can you can actually get a, a feel for um, how different parts of the country end up with with different dominant types of organisms. And so um, evaluating mold problems in buildings really is a regional type of thing. And you know, I mean, I've I've spent time in um, 38 out of 50 states. Um, and um, uh, so I've got a I've got a pretty good comfort level with most of the United States, uh, you know, dividing it up into geographic areas and understanding that things are going to be completely different east of the Rockies. That you've got uh, higher humidity levels and and um, and different types of microflora. Uh, and and actually, on that first ERMI study that EPA did of the 1,096 homes, um, it was skewed towards the East Coast. There was a whole lot more homes on the East Coast than on the West Coast. I think they did a, a total of, I think it was eight or 12 in California. Um, and so, you know, it it, um, it makes it harder to evaluate um, things when you don't have those databases. But um, I, I know Michael has built up his database for the work that he's been doing. And, and we built up the database for uh, Northern California. And so it's, it's resulted in some specific changes uh, like, for example, uh, our company doesn't do a 36 organism Hermie sample. We're doing um, MSQ PCR for 39 organisms. We've added in uh, these extra three that we see on a regular basis. And, um, um, and that's, you know, it's a part of the research that we're doing, but it's also a part of helping people understand what really is going on in their home uh, because there's a lot more than just those 36. John, you're also doing stuff differently too. I'll let you spend a minute on it or two, whatever you want. But 
you're taking outdoor control samples now too. A lot of people think when I take an ERMI sample or when you take an ERMI sample, you shouldn't need to take an outdoor sample because there's the group two column. Could you help kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we do, we, we tend to do quite a few samples. We're, uh, we're taking a 2,000 square foot place and dividing it up into quadrants and doing, you know, like four sample sets from logical er areas. We're not going to take a great room and, and chop it up and do multiple samples in that area. But, uh, you know, if we've got 350 square foot bedrooms that are all side by side or close to one another, we'll probably combine those into, into one sample. Uh, just because we need to be able to get enough dust for the analysis to actually provide us the information that, that we need. Um, but what we find is that the closer you are to where the problem is, uh, the, um, uh, the higher the levels will be. And, um, and that's because, you know, if you think of mold like invisible dandelions, the place where the release occurs, you're going to get the highest concentration. The seeds from the dandelion will settle in that vicinity, but some are gonna make it into the neighbor's yard. Some are gonna make it halfway down the block, a very few, but, but some. And so this gives us the ability to figure out the geographic representations within the home itself. Um, and when we're, when we're dealing with you know, the nation and the variables within the nation, that's also a real important thing to take into consideration. Right, yeah. As a professional, we're, we're doing interzonal comparisons, we're comparing that with databases that we may have, whether it's outdoor influence, whether it's some sort of statistical um, reporting on relationships, as John was saying, to like this concept of like ground zero to traditionally will be where you'll find the highest concentrate. There's always anomalies, but um, the, the, on a curve, you'll normally see at the closer you get to the source, the higher it gets. These are things that make sense. Um, there's a lot more that John and I, and we might very well have a podcast in the future that dives in deeper with MSQPCR analysis, but I think how we could wrap this up before we mention Hurts Me Too, if you're okay with that, John, is um, MSQPCR, where the audience member might previously have thought about it as an ERMI, is a fantastic tool to use. It's like anything. It takes practice, it takes time, um, you, you don't just walk up and buy one the first time and you become an, uh, an expert or a professional in its use. It's not something that you should take lightly. If you're considering doing your own MSQPCR, maybe it's labeled as an ERMI sample, we highly recommend that you uh, work with somebody who has the knowledge. You don't have to work with John or I. Uh, this is not a marketing scheme, uh, scheme here, but find somebody who has the knowledge um, uh, there's different resources, there's surviving mold, there's the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, there's a bunch of different resources that you might find you can find professionals like John and I, who can help you with in this, the process, you can still do some DIY, John and I, as an example, have to do many virtual consultations with people, the point is not about that, the point is that you want the guidance, don't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go, you wouldn't drive a boat by yourself the first time if you've never been in a boat you'd want to learn its operations the safety features how to properly turn it on have to how to properly navigate on the water and to use a thousand other types of examples it's the same way with this type of analysis there's a lot of ways that you can get false negatives false positives and there's a lot of there's a lot of uh inclination for people to put too many eggs in the basket of an ermi by itself or or a petri dish or a spore trap sample there's a lot that's involved beyond the sampling one of the other things that come up is the different ways of interpreting data. And some of us has, have heard about the term hurts me too. Um, hurts me too, just to help people real quick, was a method of measurement re uh, that correlated with health that Dr. Richie Shoemaker looked at. Now, it's a, good, it's a good darn thing that he it actually defines what Hurts Me Too stands for, because that's always a tongue twister, but health effects roster of type specific of mycotoxins and inflammagens version two. There was a version one at one point. Hurts Me Too takes a look at five molds, Aspergillus penicillioides, Aspergillus versicolor, Catonium globosum, Stachybotrys chitarum, and Wollemia CV. Those five molds happen to be on the ERMI panel. Now, where there's been some confusion, especially if you're not in the CIRS water damage building type exposures in, this, in the Dr. Re Shoemaker research category, 
is understanding where its value is. So John, here's what I'm gonna ask you without putting you on the spot. You obviously know what a hurts me too is. You know it's limited to the five organisms versus a panel of 36 as a standard comparison. What, what do you, how do you feel hurts me too can be useful where it may play a role for you or the clients? Well, I, I like using hurts me too uh, as an evaluation criteria on an ERMI uh, or 36 organism or 39 organism MSQPCR. As you said, we can see all five of those organisms on, on the, uh, the standard uh, analysis. Um, I can calculate a hurts me too from an MSQPCR 36. Right. I can't go the other way. Right. Um, and so if, if your hurts me too is coming back high um, all by itself, then that, um, that probably has some, some real significance, although it's not looking as many organisms and there are many other organisms that, that can be issues as well. Um, where I get concerned is where I see a hurts me too that comes back uh, with all zeros or, or very low levels that, that basically by you know, comparing to the chart and, and looking at it that way, it looks like everything is fine. Um, and one reason is because I can't do the, the quality control checks. If the laboratory is not posting their uh, geotricum control numbers and, and uh, uh, the cycle times and all these various types of things that, that help me to interpret the validity of the sample, um, then I wanna see that our uh, group two organisms, the cladosporium, cladospories one and two, and, Cladosporium herbarium and um, and uh, and other organisms are at what we would consider um, normal uh, levels or higher. Um, if if there's an absence of those organisms, I can't tell that from a from a five organism panel, and therefore I can't evaluate the uh, potential validity of, of those results. Um, so. Um, I think too, the, the reasons why people are um, checking out their home with regards to mold uh, can, can have a great deal of bearing on what types of organisms need to be considered. Um, I, had a, I had a case a while back uh, that I'll never forget. The client was um, visiting Spain, had a massive coronary, ended up in the hospital, woke up in the hospital, and the doctor was telling him, uh, you gotta have a heart transplant. Your, your heart is not going to uh, last much longer. Uh, you need to get a heart transplant. And of course, based on our experience here in the United States where organs are hard to get and it's not uncommon for people to, to uh, end up uh, having to go on to you know, mechanical um, uh, circulating devices to, to keep them alive for long periods of time. And, and some of them don't live long enough to get that transplant. Um, his doctor in Spain said, we've got you scheduled for a transplant tomorrow morning. We've, uh, we've got a suitable donor. And so um, uh, first thing tomorrow morning, you'll be getting your transplant. And he was just, he was amazed by this. Well, um, it turns out that in Spain, they've got two differences in their laws that have made for lots of available organs. One is that they have no motorcycle helmet laws. And most people that uh, drive or ride motorcycles are um, healthy donors. Um, and so with no helmet laws, they end up with a lot more people that are uh, brain injured. And um, uh, so a greater availability of organs. Um, but the other thing that I think makes a great deal of difference is in Spain, you have to opt out if you don't want to be an organ donor. In the United States, you have to opt in if you want to be an organ donor. And so they had plenty of organs available. He got his transplant. When he came out of surgery, his doctor said, so now I need to ask you some uh, questions before we send you back home to the United States. Has your home ever had a water damage? <laughs> how many, how often do people get asked these questions? You know, I mean, it's starting to happen more and more. And in fact, when he responded, oh yeah, our basement flooded about six months ago, uh, his doctor in Spain happened to know a doctor in San Francisco who knew me. And so he was referred to me and we went in and tested. And in that case, we were looking for specific types of organisms that are likely to cause a condition called aspergillosis. Um, aspergillosis is a condition. Uh, it, it's the most common death, cause of death in um, um, 
transplant patients that have been given anti-rejection drugs. It's a very common cause of death in uh, people that have received chemotherapy. And so the types of organisms that we need to look for in those conditions um, are, are real important and um, quite a bit different than, than from an allergy or asthma type of standpoint, um, or from a chronic inflammatory response syndrome standpoint. So the Hertzme scoring system was developed to help predict um, situations where there's a greater likelihood of chronic inflammatory response syndrome, CIRS. Um, but it may not be the appropriate thing to be looking at for uh, uh, transplant patients or people that are suffering from hypersensitivity pneumonitis or allergies or asthma or other types of conditions that, uh, uh, that may have a, a component where mold is uh, an important consideration. So like the discussion we were having earlier with MSQPCR, hurts me too, may have its place. Um, it depends on the situation. I will say just from my own personal experience, there's always inherently bias, but I'll give you mine. Um, I generally agree that when you have a higher Hertz me score, it typically means it's more suggestive of a potential issue. John and I wouldn't put all of our eggs or our entire bet on just that result. We'd want to dive further, but it's not uncommon if you have an elevated Hertz me two score that the molds on those that roster of five are high enough to where there it, it, the higher that number gets that Hertz me two score the the more it becomes suspicious that this might be coming from an indoor source and not necessarily an outdoor background you know in a tropical climate like miami florida or a lot of the caribbean i think hawaii as well you know aspergillus penicillioides is a common outdoor mold we yeah. can't we see it flourish right and yet that's one of the five molds on a hurts me panel so the point is is we take we're taking that into consideration and that's not something the normal the public would normally know so just because you do do a hurts me too um, it does, and, and let's say it comes back questionable or, or, or failing, that needs to be addressed, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the source is inside. There's a lot that we have to take into consideration when we're doing this. Um, for those of you that are following, and there's all sorts of protocols out there, and fortunately, John and I aren't doctors, so and we, 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 per, we perform uh, home inspections holistically the same, obviously, with key differences. The example he used about a patient with a heart transplant um, and looking at pathogenic type molds that might create disease like aspergillosis in the lungs, how those sorts of things are custom to the home. But holistically, we're using the same flashlight. We're using the same moisture meter. And we're looking at the types of tools that we might use to sample. For me personally, if as somebody who also has CIRS and is following the Shoemaker protocol and has been a very successful treatment for me personally, I wholeheartedly agree that if you are one of those individuals, you'll be required to look at getting a passing hurts me score as part of that treatment protocol. So everything has their place. And if you go online, whether you go to, well, there's a couple of different labs out there that offers um, hurts me's and ermies, you want to slow down real quick and see what's the best fit for you. But there's no doubt that these types of tools have been looked at. I don't know of any other doctor or any other study that has looked at chronic illness. We're not talking about an allergy right now. We're not talking about giving the snivels in the wintertime. We're talking about an inflammatory response. No one knew what the word cytokines were until COVID came out. Now the public knows more about cytokines that they ever cared to know about because they're realizing that this has to do with inflammation of the body. Um, this particular test, unlike the ERMI, is health-based. But there's a lot of um, there's a lot of opinions out there that John and I are all too familiar about. And what I will tell you is I don't know of any other paper that's been published that dives this deep. Um, I know of other papers that get into allergies and incidents of, but that's not what we're talking about. Before we wrap up today, I wanna I wanna end with any sort of extra takeaways with John. And again, just to be clear, MSQPCR is a wonderful tool. Um, we're not diagnosing you or your home with an ERMI score. The ERMI data and all of the research and the raw data that Dr. Vesper and others have put together is invaluable. John and I wouldn't be able to do the level of forensics if it wasn't for that. We need to separate and clear up the confusion that if someone says they want you to do an ERMI 
that they probably shouldn't be looking simply at the ERMI score. Oftentimes, I don't even look at it once, but they need to have the skills and the tool sets to look at the individual mold species and their physiology to be able to help determine based off of so, some control data, some data set, whether or not your home reflects normal fungal ecology. You might have a little bit of stacky in your home and that's normal. And then maybe you wanna lower that for a variety of reasons we're not gonna get into today. And maybe you can work with a professional to help lower those levels because maybe they are coming from the outside. There's all sorts of wonderful ways we can help improve the environment if it's even felt needed. The Hurts Me Too has a place as well. Uh, it might be more specific to the person and their diagnosis, but I think it's a great way to start for people if they're not sure if they wanna dip their toes in the water. I, regardless, I think you should spend the money and, and work with a professional because you can oftentimes get confused if you're doing things on your own and following the lab instructions. John and I've heard horror stories, unfortunately, about people who have done their own samples and then they either go online asking people on social media groups to help them interpret it or worse yet, the labs offer advice that perhaps they shouldn't be uh, offering that can feel overwhelming and trigger the limbic system and other issues. John, is there anything that else that we can add to the audience before we sign off today regarding the top of the MSQ, PCR, ERMIs, yeah. or hertz me twos I, I think that um, I'd, I'd like to touch on one thing that relates to what you were just talking about. Yeah. Um, for a long time, there was a recommendation with do-it-yourself kits that um, you not sample below three feet. Um, now, let's talk about that. Yeah. And... And the, the problem with that is some of the spores are very heavy. Uh, Stachybotrys and Ketomium in particular, um, it only takes them about five minutes to settle out of the air um, if, if they're present in the environment. They're not floating around all the time. They drop out very quickly. Uh, whereas your Penicillium and Aspergillus organisms, uh, those will typically float around for about eight, uh, four to eight hours before they manage to settle out in, in still air. Um, the recommendation to always sample higher than three feet, I, I think its basis was from the standpoint of an exposure assessment. Um, you know, what is what is within your breathing height? You're not down on the floor. Well, now, wait a minute. My grandkids are down on the floor all the time, and I'm down on the floor with them. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where if you want to diagnose your home, you may use a different methodology than you would use if you're trying to diagnose your exposure. Um, but from, um, from the standpoint of figuring out what's going on in the home, I want dust to be collected from down low. I like tops of baseboards. I like lower shelves and things of that nature. I don't like going under the bed or under a table because these boards, these particles, they settle downward, they land on surfaces. And so you're more likely to find more on top of the table than you are under the table. Yeah, um, but um, but the way that we look at our buildings, um, I think is is real important. And understanding the dynamics of how particles behave. I um, noticed you have a book behind you, although it's tucked away. I'm pretty sure it's the same book. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's complicated, right? It, it depends. You you said it better than I could have. You're you're being considerate to the idea that yes, even my guilty. Uh, sample three feet or higher, there were considerations like a false positives, so you tracking it in from the outside. That was one of the original concerns mm -hmm. uh, when they were sampling off the carpets in the living room and the master bedroom in the original Ermi collection. But John has brought this point up now. He's brought it up to me before. And it, and it is a sobering reminder that it's complicated. There are situations where, like you said, well, wait a second, we are on the floor or the, the characteristics of certain molds like stacky in a sedentary environment, uh, or actually in a, in a test tube where there's no air movement, settling quick, even if it's not five minutes, it's not 15 minutes, gravity's going to win. And so you're going to have a representation oftentimes on those horizontal surfaces. And is John advocating randomly, blindly sampling the hallway down your bedroom, your bedroom hallway? No, it's to consider that we need to get a wider, um, representation of the available molds that might be there but but what john's not said or hasn't had an opportunity to say because i just interrupted him was that it all depends 
uh, I tell you, well, the, the, the number one phrase that I've read so far in the book behind me right there, and by the way, this is John's Prescriptions for a Healthy House, by the way, a wonderful book that John can share with you too. He mentioned earlier, and I was going to say something about when you're talking about building healthy homes, what to consider, but let me reel in my ADD real quick. This book right here, a lot of it is, it depends. And so you need to understand that it's not, you don't just simply take a sample off the baseboard without considering how the, what the dust you're sampling there may really represent. And, and, and ultimately what John and I, I don't wanna speak for you, John, but one of the things I know we're concerned about is you getting misleading data? Is you chasing an issue that never was an issue in your home? It was something that came from somewhere else. Feel free to expand on that, John. Well, there there are a lot of techniques that we can use for narrowing things down. You know, I, MSQ PCR is reported in spore equivalents per milligram of dust. Right. And um, the the thing is that can be misleading too, based on the amount of dust that you're able to collect. I've got two identical places. Uh, you know, this room is the same size as this room, and both of them have the exact same amount of stachybotrys in them. Let's say they have a, a thousand spores of stachybotrys in both of these. And I've only got five milligrams of dust to collect from this room, but I've got a gram of dust to collect from this room. That's a gram is a thousand milligrams. Well, when we do our spore equivalents per milligram of dust calculation, Five milligrams of dust means that this room would have 200 spore equivalents in it, whereas this room would only have one spore equivalent per milligram of dust in it. Right. And they're identical in terms of the exposure. And so all of these are more complicated things that have to be taken into consideration when we um, evaluate the reports. The, the labs that I like to work with, they tell me not only how much dust they used, but they also tell me how much dust was in the sample that was supplied to them. Right. And a lot of labs won't give us that information. And that is just so critical from my standpoint of understanding, you know, do I have a very clean environment or do I have a very dirty environment? Yeah. Now, I go back and I talk to my clients. I'm not doing this in a vacuum. I'm I'm talking to them. I'm saying, did you have trouble getting enough dust? How how much dust were you able to collect? How how dirty was that swiffer wipe? And so we can get an idea of, of what needs to be done from that standpoint. But there are other techniques that we can use for determining the, the general quantities and the, and the more specific locations where there are pathways uh, for these organisms to work their ways out of hidden locations. You've got visible growth. You don't need to go down these roads. You, you know where that problem is. Right. The question becomes, is there another problem someplace else that you don't know about that's hidden? Um, and the nature of mold is that it grows where the moisture is. And wall cavities, if they get wet, they tend to stay wet longer than the areas within the living space. So it's not uncommon for there to be hidden types of, of conditions. Thank you for that added piece. So again, as you guys are hearing, uh, MSQPCR analysis definitely has its place, definitely should be used with a professional. You want to get curious, you want to dip your toes in the water a little bit and do your own research experiment, you can. But understand that there's a lot to take into consideration. What John and I talked about today just covers, it covers more than just the tip of the iceberg, but there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. And then ultimately putting it together, um, thinking outside the box of just what we found, but why it's there in the first place. Um, so thank you, John, for taking the time to meet with me today to kind of dive into the nuts and bolts of MSQPCR, what it is, what it's not, how it is related, but often is not related to the concerns of an ERMI sample uh, and a little bit about H, uh, Hurts Me Too sampling. We look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. The content of this show is for informational purposes and represents the sole opinion of the host and its interviewees only. Any reliance on the information provided in this show is done at your own risk. Additional opinions and or research may change our current view of the topics spoken in this show. We do our best to minimize any inaccuracies presented and make legitimate efforts to back all comments with our own field experience, independent literature, or studies that support the topics discussed.
This information should not be used to make conclusive decisions regarding your health or exposure. Ultimately, all questions and or concerns regarding your health should be addressed by a qualified physician. Additional exposure concerns and or questions pertaining to the health of your home or building should be addressed by qualified and on-site professionals. Any and all products and services discussed in this show should not be construed as a recommendation, endorsement, or guarantee that their use is appropriate for your situation. In short, we hope this information is of value to you, but please do not act upon it without actual and individual consultation and guidance by professionals who have taken the time and appropriate collection of data to assess your unique situation.